We're excited that you're here as well. We're in this series called I Don't Believe in Church. Let me start off and just say, how many of you love church here, right? Come on, where are the church lovers at? So we're doing this series, though, because not everybody believes like you believe or have the experiences, maybe, that you've been blessed to have. In fact, some people get to this place where they just give up on church, and they're not necessarily, sometimes they're giving up on faith in Jesus all together, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's, it's at least it doesn't start that way, where they go, oh, okay, I don't have a problem with Jesus. It's just the church thing that I can't get on board with. And we're in the last installment, like part four of this series. If you missed any of them, you got to go check them out because we've kind of laid a framework and a foundation on laying on top of each other to lead up to today and the message that we're going to be talking about today. But really, as we're answering these questions about hypocrisy and judgment and hurt and the things that that show up in the church that that's in every one of our hearts, but somehow we got to learn how to get along and work with each other and reconcile and be humble through all those things. What we're really learning, I think, in this series is that this is a, a series for the spiritually mature. Like this is, this, is, this is a series that's like, hey, grow up. Uh, instead of give up, grow up. Instead of give up and throwing up your hands, it's time to grow up and actually learn the things that we need to learn and have the hard conversations that we need to have and grow up in Christ. First Timothy chapter three says like this. This is the, the theme verse of this series. This is why the actual uh, New Testament, most of it was written to help grow you up and to learn how the Bible says so that you'll know how to live in the family of God. And that family is the church. So we read the scriptures and we study the scriptures and we hear these messages and you listen on YouTube and all these other things and all, most of these writings and as you the, the attempt in God's will through the scriptures is so that you could grow and learn how to get along in the body of Christ and have healthy relationships and healthy marriage and healthy friendships and a healthy community in the family of God. And we learn like in 1 John, it's not in your notes, but in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, the Bible says that if we say we love God and we hate our brother, then the truth isn't in us. So that's why I say this is, this is a series for the mature because, because if you've actually come to this place where you said, well, I'm just gonna give up on the church, then it just reveals your level of maturity, that you are spiritually immature and it's time to grow up and have the hard conversations both with yourself, with God, and with others. And today is another hard conversation we're gonna have. We're gonna grow up a little bit today, okay? We're gonna grow up. So here's the last topic I wanna talk about, because this is something that people have. People have this mindset about the church, and it may sound something like this. Well, the church doesn't really care about you. The church just wants your money. The church just wants your money. That's what they want, man. That's what I don't want, man. And so and now, historically, there's a tension here as it relates to like money in the church, because historically, there's been some shady, disgusting things. And it's not just a modern day issue. You guys recognize that. You probably are familiar with the modern day issue, televangelists selling oil for healing or a handkerchief or something like that, promising that God's going to use that. And it's just the ridiculous things that we see people abusing the word of God mismanaging the scriptures, manipulating people, and it's disgusting. And as a pastor, I can't stand it. It makes my job harder to help lead people to truth and understanding the truth about generosity and the truth about your finances, the wisdom of scriptures, because we have all this baggage represented on media and, and, and on all these platforms. And, and it's, it's not just a modern day issue. This has been going on since the beginning of time. Money has been and finances and resources have been mismanaged, abused, and manipulated even. Even like in the church, in the early church, the Catholic church, the, uh, the Pope, I think it's Pope Leo X, was, he's the one who instituted the, the pain for the forgiveness of your sins. That, some of y'all don't know that, but that was like, like and, and so Leo had an extravagant lifestyle. And he would use the church money, the money that came in, to fund his travels and his lifestyle and his stuff. And, and, and when, the, when the treasury ran out, he said, oh, I got an idea. Here's what we'll do. People need forgiveness. Let's charge them for it. Let's charge them for forgiveness. And you know what? If they want a loved one to go to heaven, they can pay for that too. We'll just pay the way. And if they already passed away, if they could pass away, you can, you can, you can pay. And, 
they'll go to heaven. Disgusting, right? Gross things that have happened, not just in modern day, but throughout the church. So, so I, I can, again, in every one of these topics, like uh, where people arrive at, I just don't believe in this whole church thing. I can sympathize because I can see the gross things just like you that you have seen um, in our culture and even in our history. And I know that money can be an uncomfortable topic to talk about. Money can be an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people in church um, to talk about, but Jesus actually talked about this topic a lot in the scriptures. It was that important. So here's the tension. Yes, it's gross, and yes, there's mismanagement and stuff, but we can't turn our head from it. We, can't, we, we, we cannot disregard the scriptures and what Jesus has said, because he actually talked about finances more than heaven and hell combined. He talked, 11 out of the 39 parables, Jesus talked about finances. So he had a lot to say about finances. Here's one of them, and this is like the why. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus says, for wherever your treasure is, there what? Your heart will be also. And that, that there's the, Jesus told us that there is a, wherever that you're storing up the treasure and you're putting your resources, your heart's gonna follow that thing. So he goes on to say, store up for yourselves, treasures in heaven, not on earth, because what he wants and what he desires is for your heart to be after the things of heaven, the things that matter in eternity, not the things that matter on this earth. So he says, hey, wherever your treasure is there, there your, your heart and your hope is going to follow. First Timothy chapter six, let's stay in there. We, 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 in our theme verse is first Timothy, and the, we read how uh, the Apostle Paul is writing the scriptures so that we'll know how to, you know, operate in the family of God and have healthy relationships. In the same book, later on, a couple chapters later, Paul addresses the topic of finances to the early church as well. And I'm just laying, I'm laying a foundation for the Bible study that we're going to get into. Do you guys mind if we study the Bible? Just to, I got some, I, I, I want to apply the truth and what it means to you, but we're going to do, we're going to do some deep digging on this and do some study of the word of God together before we get into the application. Here's what the, the apostle Paul told Timothy. He said, command those. Now that's a strong language, right? For Paul to say, hey, Pastor Timothy, I want you, now you can see how some people manipulate the word and they get up here and go, I'm gonna command people, okay? So here's, he says, command those who are rich in this present world. And before you check out and you go, that's not me, that is you, Okay. That's every one of us are rich in this present world. Rich is having more than you need, and every one of us have more than what we need. If you have more than, if, you, if it took you more than two seconds to pick your clothing today, if you, oh, what do I wear today? And you had a few more options, you're rich, okay? If you gotta ever, ever talk to your spouse or your kids, what do you want to eat today? I don't know, what do you want to eat? You rich, okay? You rich. You don't, we just don't know. We don't, we don't recognize the, the richness. If you make, check it out, if you make $33,500 a year, if that's your annual income, $33,500 a year, then you are in the top 5% wage earners in the world. You are of the wealthiest people in the entire world, okay? And so for some of you that are like, I don't make that, Pastor. I'd encourage you to, like you're still rich. I'd encourage you to go to like worldwealth.org. I think it's World wealth.org, something like that. Go on there, find it. Type in your earning, and you'll see what percentage uh, you have of the world's wealth. Because I got, I got good news for you. You're rich. But I got bad news for you. You're rich. Jesus said it is spiritually hazardous to be rich. Okay? It's, it's, it's a hazard. It's a danger. You got to watch out. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in their riches, in their wealth, in that richness, and what they've accumulated. I think there's this false, and this is why Jesus talked about it so much, is because there's this false idea, a lie, a deception of the enemy that, that sounds something like this. If I just had more money then, that if I had more money, I'd have less problems, and that's just not the reality. Because the most important, the biggest and most important things in your life cannot be solved with money. You think about what money can give you, you think about some things on your list, but that's never the most important or the biggest things in your life. Think about it, your marriage. Your problems in your marriage cannot be solved with money. In fact, you get more money and it makes more marriages worse. Money makes mar your marriage worse. It's a money problem. Or your kids, you can't win your kids with money. In fact, most kids are lost because of money, okay? 
So, you, so it's not more money, less problems. More money just magnifies your money problems. Because you're a bad steward then, and you're going to be a bad steward now. So it ain't going to imagine. If you don't believe me, look at it. Look at the lottery winners. Look at your athletes. Look at your, look at your TV stars. All of them have more money, but, but they didn't get more wisdom with it. Because more money doesn't mean more wisdom, okay? So, so he says, don't put their, the, hey, be careful. Don't put your hope in that wealth because it's so uncertain, but put your hope in God. That's what I need you to put your hope somewhere else. He says, God is the one who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. Do you know God wants you to enjoy life? Like he wants you to enjoy the things he provides, like God does. That's okay. Now there's some assumptions with that, that you're being generous and that you're stewarding it. But God wants you to enjoy. You don't have to feel sorry for enjoying your life. You don't have to feel sorry if you want to go on that vacation, go do that thing. There's some assumptions with it. Stop feeling, stop feeling sorry for, for your provision, for your wealth. Don't feel sorry for it. God wants you to enjoy what you provide. Here's where we get into trouble. When we try to enjoy what God hasn't provided. Oh, when you try to enjoy what God hasn't, because we try to, instead of living under the provision of God, we come outside and reach outside the provision of God to get other things, whether that is getting into more debt or cheating on the one you love. You need to start enjoying the thing that God has provided for you. Can I get an amen, somebody? That's a whole message right there in and of itself. God provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them, here's what he wants you to do with your riches, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and be generous and willing to share. And he says, if you do this, if, if we do this, if we get this right, then what we're doing is what Jesus told us. We're laying up treasures for ourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, the one in heaven. We're doing what Jesus told us. If we're doing these things, we're laying up treasures in the right place so that you can take hold of the life that is truly life, he says. Okay, so... In this talk today, in, in this conversation, we're just going to have, uh, and I hope that you can put down the walls for just a moment and just allow us to study the Word of God. Anytime I talk about finance and stuff, I feel the tension in the room. I see you looking, too. You're like, honey, should we leave? I see you. Do you know I see you? I see you, okay? So, so let's let that guard down just for the next 30 minutes or so, and let's just look at the Word of God and what it has to say. Here's the promise I'm, of the next half hour, okay? I promise I'm not going to tell you what to do with your money. I promise I will not tell you what to do with your money. Psalm chapter 24, verse 1. <laughs> the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. So look, listen, God owns it all. It's all his. Job chapter 41 says, everything under heaven, God says, everything under heaven belongs to me. I want you to think about this. Think about this for a moment. Like right now, just stop. And think. Think about all your stuff. All the stuff that you have. Do you really believe it belongs to God or you? Like, I think we get confused because we, we see the name on the bank statement or the check, and we go, no, that's mine. And we get really confused on the name that's attached to that, but God says it is his. He owns it. He owns it all. So part of the tension with this idea of the, the mismanagement of the scriptures of people like abusing the whole finance thing and prosperity teachers and all that is, is they're, they're not rightly dividing the word of God. And people are not the ones who are receiving it, just receiving it. So they're just taking, and by the way, never just take what I say or YouTube says or the podcast says, study the word of God for yourself and understand what it says. But the problem with this is that people aren't rightly dividing. So not only is it a mismanagement thing and a manipulation thing and things that we're seeing, but there's a whole nother camp that's just like, doesn't know their word, doesn't know their word. And so they're not stewarding what God has given them according to, this, according to the word. So I think what we need to do is learn God's word as it relates to our generosity and our finances so that you won't be swayed by false doctrine and false teaching so that you'll be able to discern truth where, no matter where it's coming from. So here's the big, the big question. Like, like when people say, oh, church don't care about you. They just, they just want your money. Really what it comes down to is this topic right here. The question is, should 
Christians tithe? Should Christians tithe? Now, let me just say right off the bat, uh, because I feel the walls going up. Let me just say right off the bat, the tithe is not a law. And if someone has taught you that it was a law or a legalistic requirement, they were not teaching the full truth of the gospel, okay? That's just the bottom line. The tithe is not the law. It is not a law at at all, okay? I think even the question of, though, should Christians tithe becomes very bizarre when you understand what it really is. You see, the tithe is not a law. It's a spiritual discipline. So, so you know what spiritual disciplines are? Spiritual discipline of, of like prayer, that's spiritual discipline, reading your Bible, serving. Those are spiritual disciplines. Here's how I define a spiritual discipline. A spiritual discipline is an intentional behavior with a supernatural benefit. See, when, that's what discipline, like when I, when, I, when I do this, when I have this behavior, this discipline, man, it supernaturally benefits in my life. So, so for instance, we don't need God, we don't need to pray because God needs it but because we need it. God don't need you to pray. He already knows your thoughts and needs before you ever ask, okay? We don't need to worship God because God needs your worship. No, we need to worship God. We don't read our Bible because God needs us to read our Bible, but because we need to read our Bible. These are spiritual disciplines. This is, we don't serve because God needs us to serve him. No, he don't need you. He's got it all, and he owns it all. We don't serve because God needs it. We serve because it does something inside of us. All right, here's the discipline. We don't tithe because God needs it. He don't need it. He owns it all. We don't tithe because God needs it, but because we need it. There is a supernatural benefit to every spiritual discipline. I'm telling you, there is a supernatural benefit to this principle of tithing that that protects your heart from the deceitfulness of wealth, from the scheme of the enemy. And it supernaturally preserves your wealth. And I'm going to try to show you through the scriptures how, okay? But there's some common reactions, some common reactions I get whenever I teach about finances or the tithe, especially you may be in one of these. Let me just give them to you real quickly, okay? Here's the first one, common reaction. Number one, we get the people that say, oh, I absolutely agree. Like people are just like, man, I couldn't imagine not tithing. I've seen the benefit and the blessing. Man, can I tell you a story? And all the tithers said, see, I didn't coach them on that. That just happened. We didn't have a meeting before this. And we're like, hey, when I say, no, no. They just know like the amazing benefit. And I've heard story after story. I was meeting with someone last month that said they have tithed ever since they gave their life to Christ. And now they, they, they are blessed beyond measure, beyond what they can afford. They're in just a, a regular job, but own like houses and things. And just because God has blessed them abundantly. I've seen it. I've seen it. So we got a camp of people that already know. You know, you know, man, amen. The tithe, I know. I've seen it. I believe it. It works. But we have this second response that is, well, I didn't know. I didn't know. Maybe you're a new Christian or maybe you were a part of a church that really didn't teach on money or they were afraid to talk about money. Let me show you this verse. Deuteronomy chapter 14 is a great foundational verse Um, to kind of teach and lay a foundation about the tithe. Deuteronomy chapter 14 says this. You must set aside a tithe of all your crops, one-tenth. That's what a tithe literally means. It means one-tenth. That's what the tithe is. One-tenth of all the crops you have each year. So their crops were like, that's what they did. That was their livelihood. That was their, and so every harvest, so every year when they had a harvest, they would come bring a tithe or a tenth Back for us, it would be every time we had increase, every time we had a harvest, every time I got paid, I got a paycheck, a tenth, I'm bringing a tenth of that each time, each time, okay? And he says this, bring this tithe to the designated place of worship, okay? So in, in this time, when this was written, Deuteronomy, that was the temple. In our day, it's the local church. So the tithe does not go to the, you, don't, you don't split up the tithe. Here's some to Caleb. Here's some to my preacher and sneaker. <laughs> here's, here's some to this one. I like this ministry over here, and I like this over here. You don't, you don't, you don't divide it up because it's not yours to divide. It's not yours, okay? It doesn't belong to you, all right? So you can give to those things above the tithe if you want. That's called an offering. But he says, hey, give the, this is what the tithe. The tithe is for your designated place of worship, the place where the Lord God chooses 
for his name to be honored. That's one of the ways we honor the name of God is through the tithe. And then this last line, I love it. He says, and eat it there in his presence. So here's what happened. They would come and bring a tithe. They'd get their harvest. They would come and bring the tithe of that, the tenth of that, of their crops, of their, of their livestock, of everything they had, uh, of their wine and grain and all that stuff. And they would just come and bring that. And they would separate a, a portion of it. it. would go to the priest for the funding of the ministry of the temple. And they, they'd give a portion to the priest. And then this other portion, they would actually cook and light on the altar and be a sweet fragrance to God. And some of it, they would actually eat there with their family and their friends. It was like having a a potluck, and it was having lunch with the Lord. They were just eating in the presence of God. And here's the cool thing about this, you guys. I, need you, I want you to see this, that their own tithe nourished them. That their giving fed them. See, your giving to your church is what funds the ministry that feeds you. That's the principle. That's that, that's, that's why we, we, we give, you guys. It's like buying groceries, and God turns it into a meal and feeds your soul. And if you ever heard people say, well, I'm just not getting that much out of it, maybe it's because you're not putting anything into it. Because Jesus said your heart would actually follow this. See, some of you have never given to this ministry. And think about this. Other people have been picking up the check for your meal. Like, Every, maybe for weeks or months or years. And you know why? Because they love you. And you know why? Because someone did it for us. <laughs> someone did it for us so that we can know the Lord and grow in the Lord and follow the Lord, all right? So here's the last common response. And I'm gonna sit on this one um, probably a little, bit, a little bit longer. Number three the, uh, is, or the third one is, I don't think I can. Some people just don't think they can. They can't imagine living like less than their current needs because they're living above their needs as it, sta- as it stands right now. But this is where you have to understand the supernatural benefit of tithing. It never results in less. It always results in more. It always does. And I'll say this until it stops being true, you guys. 90% with God's blessing is better than 100% without it. Okay? It is absolutely, and if it's scary, I get it. I'll give you some practical advice here toward the end of the message in just a minute. But can I just encourage you, if, it's, if you're stressed out about your finances, can I encourage you, trust God in this area of your finances. Start to trust God here. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says it like this. He says, so don't worry about these things, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? These things, look, at they dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But you have a heavenly Father. He already knows about your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So look, it's okay for people who don't know God to worry, but not for you, child of God. You have a father who knows you and loves you and will care for you and meet every one of your needs. It is, that's, that's his promise according to the scripture. And my years of pastoring, I have never ever had somebody that loved Jesus <laughs> that was in Christ, starved to death. Never known anybody to starve to death in the church. Trust God. I know it can be stressful. I know it can, but think about what you've already entrusted God with. How are you gonna trust God with your eternal soul and not trust him with your earthly resources? He, 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 you can give, he will give you everything you need. Start to trust God in this area of your life. And then here's the fourth one. I'm gonna spend most of my time teaching this because there's, some with this topic that just believe, I don't have to. I don't have to do that. Hey, that's the Old Testament. That's the law. I'm under grace. If Jesus paid it all, why should I have to pay anything? And all these other things of like, like no, that's just, that's the, the law and we don't have to. We're not, we're not under the law. I am, look, I want to do some Bible study with you because I'm convinced that this is not like you, that this is not a law, but a spiritual discipline that brings supernatural benefit, and I'm going to show you why. I believe in this principle of God, and I, what I want to do is just is show you the scriptures, like the journey of the tithe and how it operated w- uh, without the law, before the law was ever given, under the law, in Christ, and in the church. And so just, if we can, just do a little bit of Bible study, because honestly, you, it doesn't matter what I think about it or what everyone else is trying to say or what you even think about it. What matters is what God says in his word and we need to rightly divide that. That's what matters. Not, not what anyone else says, but what the word of God says. So I wanna go on a journey 
through the scriptures. What, but do you know before like the law was ever given, there was right and wrong. Right and wrong existed before the law was ever given. In the Old Testament, the law came through Moses. It was 2,000 years after the Garden of Eden experience, okay, that the law, God actually gave a law. But right and wrong existed before that because Adam and Eve were in the garden and they ate this, this forbidden fruit and God actually punishes them for that. And then they have Cain and Abel, these kids. And here's the story, Genesis chapter four, before the law was ever given, Genesis chapter four, thank you so much. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, and while Cain cultivated the ground, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of the crops as a gift to the Lord. But Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. And here's what the Lord did. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. And this, he says, made Cain very angry. Y'all know the story. Cain goes on to kill Abel, and it was all over tithing. Can you, now this is the reason why pastors don't like preaching on tithing, okay? Because people get crazy when you talk about finances, <laughs> killing people and stuff. But he ever, like, why did God, think about this, why did God reject Cain's gift and, and accept Abel's gift? Cain gave some of his increase, but Abel gave the best portions and the first and God accepted that. Look, Cain gave a tip, and Abel gave a tithe. Okay, God is not honored with a tip. God is not honored with some or with leftovers. He's honored with the best and with the first, but you have to ask yourself, how was Cain supposed to know that he was supposed to give the best portions and the first things if the law had not even been given yet? And here's, what, here's why we know. Romans chapter 2 says this, that God's law is written in our hearts. That every one of us in our, in our hearts, we know right from wrong. We know that when Cain murdered Abel, murder was bad. And you should not have it. You don't need a law to tell you murder is bad. You know that killing somebody is bad. Just like those who are in Christ and connected to Christ, know that I honor God with the best parts of my life. I honor God by giving him the priority place in my life. God takes nothing else but the first and the best, and I know that. It is in my heart. I know it. That's how I honor God. Again, in Genesis, we see before God ever gave the law, how the tithe was practiced. Genesis chapter 14, before the law, before the law, Melchizedek, Blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe of all the goods he had recovered. So again, why did Abram, why did he do it? This was before the Old Testament law commanded God's people to tithe. Abram didn't tithe because God commanded him to. Abram didn't tithe because the TV evangelist told him he would get a thousand fold on his tithe, okay? Abram, Abram didn't tithe because he wanted victory in battle. He was already given victory. He already had the victory. He didn't tithe to get God's blessing on his life. He tithed because he was blessed by God. It, he, the tithe for him was, it was the way to thank God and honor God for his blessing. You think about this, though. Like, how much more blessed are we than Abram? Like how much more blessing? We have, we have the full gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the word of God, the Bible. We are so much more blessed. We should respond with so much more gratitude. He did it because he was grateful. Tithing was the appropriate response. We tithe out of gratitude for what God has done. Now, if that was all we knew about giving or tithing, it would still be a little bit confusing, cloudy, uncertain. So God goes on and explains it in the law and under the law. Let me show it to you, Malachi, just one occasion. Malachi chapter three, in the Old Testament law, under the law, God says, I, the Lord, do not change. So check it out. God, God is saying, look, I, my principles don't change. A lot has changed. The practices have changed. If you read the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's a lot of difference. In the Old Testament, they used to sacrifice animals to worship God. That's what they did. So so the, the practices change, but the principles are the same. The same principles you see displayed in the Old Testament run 
through the New Testament. So God is saying, look, the practice changes, but my principles do not change. I am the same. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees. You've tried to do it your way. You've tried to figure it out on your own. And look, ever since, you guys have been doing this, and you haven't kept them, he says. And he goes, return to me. Come on back to my will. Come on back to my word. Come on back to my principles and just see if my principles don't produce the supernatural benefit of your life. And I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to re- return? Will a mere mortal, mortal rob God? God says, yet you rob me. And then they ask, well, how? How are we robbing you? And God says, in tithes and offerings, you are in a stronghold. And that's why almost 50% of your prayer requests that come in that I read every week have to do with your finances. Because your finances are under a curse. It doesn't have the supernatural blessing and benefit of God. He says, look, bring to me, because this is, this is actually what re- your whole nation, because you are robbing me. And then he says, bring the whole tithe into the whole tithe into the storehouse where you're getting fed, that place of worship, that there may be food, that may be feeding you and feeding others. And then he goes on to say the only time in the New Testament, test me in this, or in the Bible, test me in this, God says. It's the only time God says, test me. Says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not, see if this supernatural blessing thing doesn't happen. See if this supernatural benefit thing doesn't happen. I'll open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there won't even be room enough to store it. Not only that, he says this, and here's the supernatural preservation of your wealth that comes with honoring God with the spiritual discipline of tithing. I'll prevent the pests from devouring your crops. Some of you get paid and you're like, where'd it go? Where'd it go? I don't know where it went. We don't have nothing to show for it again. Ah." It's because you're not using God's principles of your finances. He says, I'll rebuke that stuff from, de- from eating up, the pests from eating. And the vines in your fields, they will drop, not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then, then when you do this, all the nations, they're going to see my blessing on your life. That's what I want. I want people to see how much you're blessed by following me. That's what I want. I want them to see your blessing, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Um, I personally practice and wholeheartedly believe in the tithe. I've seen its benefit. I've seen its blessing. For those of you that don't know, like, it, <laughs> I didn't plan on saying it, but some of y'all don't know this. I don't, I, if there's like a big tithe, I don't get more money. Some people think I'm, I, I work on commission or something like that. I'm not a salesman, okay? <laughs> I am not a salesman up here. Uh, the, the trustees, our elders set, set my salary. They, and they set it by a, a local and national survey of pastors that are leading churches at this size in this county in this and and just kind of and for the first five years of our ministry I'd never accept I said no I don't want that I don't want that amount I just give it to other people until they rebuked me and my my pastors rebuked me and said you need to stop acting like like you know you're poor and start allowing God to bless you and so I was wearing it like a badge anyway different time but I just want you to know like that's not that's not the look if you give a a big tithe I'm not going to get a boat or something like that I don't take your money I don't take your money that's not for me. That's, that goes, that goes to the, so, that, so that the ministry of God can continue in this place. And if anyone goes, okay, pastor, but wait a second, that's the old covenant. Malachi is in the old covenant. We live under the new covenant of grace. Exactly. Yes. So Bible scholars, let me ask you a question. Does grace raise the standard or lower the standard? Does God empower us to for more or for less because of his grace? So let me show it to you, Matthew chapter 5. Here's not, let's look at Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said that to the people long ago, you shall not murder. But I'm going to take it to a whole nother level because what the law commanded, grace will empower you. Look, I'll tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister, will, you're subject to judgment. Hey, you've also heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I'm gonna take it to a whole nother level under this grace covenant that I'm making with you because what the law commanded, I'm going to empower you. I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, so, so it, doesn't, it doesn't take like, you know, a, a smart person to, to see this logically. You apply it to every area of your walk. See, the law came to, to teach you, but grace came to change you. Okay, so you apply it to your, to, to your tithe. You've heard that it was said, tithe the tenth of your income, but I say to you, God owns it all. God 
owns it all. So look at what Jesus, and Jesus said it very plainly in Matthew 23. Check this out. Jesus, you should tithe. Yes. All right, let's pray. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. What's more to, what's there, what's more to say? A lot like, like, okay, the ESV says, ye ought tithe. Oh, okay. Or you ought tithe. And the King James says, ought ye, yes, tithe. A lot of, so look at it. A lot of people don't, they think like, they act like Jesus didn't say this. But not only did he say it, look, he took it to another level. He says, sure, sure, tithe. But here, look, I want you to do the even great. Don't forget, neglect the more important things. Don't just hear, just obey the standard of the law. I want you to take it to the next level and do the even more important things Jesus is saying. Okay, this is, this is why, you guys, all that, that, we, that we bring into the storehouse. He didn't just, this is what we do with it. This is, we, we, ministry happens. See, like Matthew chapter 5, he just adds to it. You look at the New Testament church and how we can get back to God's design of church. And we've been talking about that. How do we get back to God's design? And, and man, if people are giving up on church, it's because the church don't look like the way it's supposed to look like. Well, what did the church look like? Acts chapter 2. Let's go back to the beginning again, and let's become an Acts 2 type of church. Acts chapter 2 says, all the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. It goes on to say that they sold all of their possessions. They gave to everyone as they had need. Now, we're not asking anyone to do that, but they brought, they didn't, look, here's the principle. They didn't just bring the tithe. They gave all they had to God. They were fully surrounded. People just didn't tithe. They give more than the tithe. There's more to, 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 there was so much more giving in the church so that they could take care of each other. So like in, in the, like when a family loses their job or loses a loved one or something like that happens, like because of our, of your generosity, we can come and, and meet a need and we can provide the meal or the hotel or to help them pay that bill or whatever it is because of your generosity, we can see souls saved and kids mentored and the next generation raised up. Okay. That's, that's, that's why we give, why we can do this because people give their tithes and their offering. And not only is the giver blessed, but others are blessed through the giving. So here's the truth. If you read the New Testament and you come away thinking that God deserves less than the tithe, read it again because you missed something. If you read the New Testament and you think that God deserves, as you look at your resources, that you are going to somehow give less than the tithe, you're fooling yourself. You need to read it again and humble yourself. The tithe is the starting line, not the finish line. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. I know I'm preaching hard on this one. I told you it's a spiritually mature series. Galatians chapter 3. Let's jump there. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian unto Christ. That's why the law was there. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. So here's how I like to say it. See, the law helped people do good. Grace allows people to be good. Okay? It changes us from the inside out. So what do we do? What do we do, church? How can we, how can we be different church, man, that honors God, is faithful to his word, doesn't manipulate people or, or try to coerce people or try to put them under a legalistic requirement, but just loves and honors God with all we have? Let me give you a few things, then we gotta go. Number one, return the first. Return the first. The first, and all of the first, the first day of the week. You know, this is, sun, this is the reason why we worship on Sunday, because the first Sunday of the month. Even your presence here is, is a sign to God that you are first, God. The first part of my week, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow the first day of the week. You can t you tithe your day in your devotion, in your prayer. You can give the first of your day. You give the first of your week. You give the first of your month and your resources in your, in your paycheck. You give the, this is the reason why we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. The first of our year, we give it to God. In every area, we put God first. And this is not a law. This is a grace, a principle that if I live, produces supernatural blessing in my life. And people ask me like, Pastor Jason, how in the world do you handle all that stuff? You must be so busy, dude. I rest. I rest every day, every week, every month, every season, every year. I'm intentional about my rest, and I'm able to accomplish more in my life because I honor God with what's first. Deuteronomy chapter 14 says this. 
The purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God what? Put God first. That's the purpose. God will take no other place but first. And there is, there is something supernatural that happens when you do bring the first of your resources, your finances, to God. In the New Testament, again, how do they practice it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? How do they practice it in the New Testament? On the first day of every week, that's their Sunday worship time, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. So it wasn't the same amount. It was a percentage. It wasn't, no one gave the same amount, but it was the same sacrifice. It was the same portion that everybody gets. It's fair. Everybody gives the tithe or saving it up so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. He says, so that I don't have to twist any arms. And thank God, over the years of discovery, I've never had to come up here and say, oh gosh, you, we really need it. This is, this is what we really need. We need to do it. Let's pick up. I need some, we need some money. No, God has provided every one of our needs. Every time we grow, like right now, we're in such a growth stage, a growth season. Our kids' ministry has been bursting. And so we're like, oh my gosh, we need space. So I told our staff, our, the staff here at Discovery, the pastors and the team that, that, that operate the ministries, I told them, you guys, we, we have to vacate our offices. We have to leave. We, we, we're going to do that within two weeks. We're moving all of our desks, all of our offices, and the kids' ministry has taken over the entire next-gen building in that lot. Kids ministry, elementary is taking over the whole thing because we're just going to put up tables in, in the worship center or something like that. We're going to get uncomfortable. God's going to provide. So we started just looking and, and like do we modulars and what do we do? And those are all crazy expensive and AC and all that stuff. And then we saw the four lease sign right here at Alpine Pastry right here. And so we went and talked to him and, and, and the Lord just opened a door. He says, sure, you guys, I would love to have the church here. And he gave us a phenomenal, crazy blessing handshake. Here's the key. And we're like, okay, I guess we're moving in over here. And so, and then check this out. Like, like we just started a mentorship program for our kids, not, not for in, in, in our Discovery Kids, the elementary, preschool age. Like we have Wednesday night kids clubs where, where they are coming to, to be mentored by men and women, separated accordingly so that men and women can mentor them. And then our youth as well is setting up mentorship where they're, there are, our youth ministries are led by youth leaders that are mentoring your students, both the, the, the girls and the boys. And we just started this thing and it's going beautiful. And we said, you know, we need to do that for our Dream Center. We've been trying to and believing to, but we were trying to get this extra unit at the Dream Center and they were wanting way too much for it to expand our ministries and we just said, you know, we're going to do it. Forget it. We're going to do it. We're going to launch it. We're going to do a mentorship ministry for kids and for youth and teenagers. And we're just going to figure it out, man. And we empowered a leader to do it. And we started moving forward. And the same day I got the keys for that office, I got a contract lease from the owners, giving us the full use of the entire storefront at the Dream Center for $1 a month. $1. The extra unit. That extra unit is $1 a month. I'm telling you, look, this is the supernatural blessing and benefit when you honor God, when you honor God. Number two, steward the rest. <laughs> steward it. You can't, don't just give the tithe and continue to mismanage the rest. So you can't give the first. You got to manage. You got to steward the rest. Jesus said, How, he can, who can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. So we got to manage that. So you got to get on what, what some of you, some of you have never been on a budget. 90% of Americans are not living on a budget. 90%. And you wonder where in the world everything is going. It's like driving your car without any gauges. I don't know how fast I'm going. I don't know if I got gas. You're going to end up on the side of the road is what you're going to end up, okay? And that's exactly like, like that's what's happening in your finances. You got no monitoring system. You got no budget. You got no gauges. So before the month ends, you're already going into negative. You're already, you don't know what, where everything is going. You need to steward the resources that God has given you. And, I, and I'm especially talking to you young adults right now and you kids, because you want in three years with the, what the previous generation got in 30. And y'all need to check your gauges and work hard, okay? Steward, well, be faithful in the, in the little things that God has given you, and then you get the big things. Some of you want the big things without faithfulness and the small things, and that's not the kingdom. That's not according to the kingdom. So steward the rest. Proverbs 21 and 5 says it like this. The plans of the diligent. That's, that's that, get a budget, plan. You're, you're gonna lead to profit, but as surely as haste, 
Lead survivorly, like, hey, what are we going to eat today? I don't know. Let's go get Taco Bell again. Let's go get this. Oh, I feel like getting a new outfit. Let's just go get it. Let's just go get a new outfit. Hey, still lead to poverty. Get yourself on a budget. Steward your resources. Some of you, if, there's something, some groups, like, I encourage everybody to go to. And there's, like, I believe everybody should be a part of, if you have any addiction or strongholds, a celebrate recovery group. If you have any anxiety and depression, you need to be a part of a freedom group. You need to, at some time in your journey here at Discovery, if that's your story, you have to have to get into there and get freedom in your life. But I think one group that everybody should be a part of is Financial Peace University. Everybody should take the small group, Financial Peace University. It's offered here at Discovery. It'll bring you, not only teach you the biblical principles, but how do you get on a budget? How, let me give me a system to get on a budget. Some of you need to do that. Let me give you the verse before the last point, Luke chapter 7. Let me give you the verse first. And he told them this parable, Jesus speaking, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Don't you feel sorry for him? He's so rich. He ain't got anywhere to put all of his, put all of his stuff. So he says, then I said, he said, uh, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, and I'm going to build bigger ones. And there, I'm just going to keep all my surplus. And I'll say, he says to myself, self, you've done plenty of good things laid up for many years. He, he erroneously thought that because he had more stuff, he had more time. Take like e e easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. And by the way, he didn't call him a fool because he had a lot of stuff. He called him a fool because he didn't know what, the, he, what to do with the extra. That's why, that's why he was a fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then, who's going to get what you prepared for yourself? You're not going to see any of that. You're not even going to get to say where it goes. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up for themselves things for themselves here on this earth, but is not rich, again, toward God. So what do we do? Number three. Focus on true riches. True riches is heaven. True riches is souls in heaven. Let me pray for you. Can you bow your heads, close your eyes all across this worship center, and you might want to turn that piano on or something so the Holy Spirit can visit us. Thank you so much. Go ahead and just bow your head right there. Some of you have believed the lie of the enemy. With every head bowed, I, I close. Come on. God, we're not going to believe this lie anymore. That money can make us secure. That money can make us happy. That money will identify us. All that, God, comes from you. And you said, test us, test you in this. And today, we're gonna take that challenge. We're gonna test you with this, God, to honor you with the tithe, the first fruit, the first and the best, God, of everything. And I pray that hundreds and thousands of families are changed because of this message of taking you at your word, God. I rebuke the devourer for your name's sake. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've never, not just not given him stuff, man, but you haven't given him your heart. And honestly, that's why, that's what God is after. He's not after your stuff, he's after your heart. And today, may be a good day to surrender that to him. And you know it. With every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you and you're maybe ready to give your life to Jesus, I'd love to pray for you. And I'm not gonna have you come up to the front or single you out. But I'd love to pray with you right where you are. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to count to three. And at the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand or click a button or type in the chat, I need Jesus. Like right now, you know that God is calling you home. If that's you, I want you to be bold. One, two, three. I need Jesus right now to change me. I need a fresh start with God all over this place. Yes, 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 yes. Leave it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Go ahead and put your hands down. When you pray like this, just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I surrender the control of my life to you. And I give it to you. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Today, I honor you for the rest of my life with the best, the first, and everything. I'm all yours and I'm all in. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord some praise if you will. Come on, can you receive that word?